His name is Mike Cassidy. And he is the CEO of his fifth startup company, Apollo Fusion. And he was the vice president and project manager of Project Loon. Has anybody heard of that? Yeah, some people, a couple people. Um, and that was basically bringing balloon powered internet to everybody. And he is the mastermind behind Direct Hit, which is a startup he built, and within 500 days, sold for over $500 million. So I hope you're taking some notes, Mike Cassidy. Hi, uh, how many uh, people are thinking about going into science or engineering? Okay, awesome. Um, maybe by the end of this presentation, we'll get it 100%. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a couple of different things today. Um, I'm gonna talk about three different projects I worked on. One was Project Loon, uh, bringing, uh, high using high altitude balloons, balloons that are 60,000 feet up, 20 kilometers up, to bring internet around the world. Uh, and just this past week, we are covering Puerto Rico. And we're bringing, um, thanks, we're bringing, uh, we connected 100,000 people in Puerto Rico. The phone you have in your pocket, if you have an LTE phone, will actually work with a balloon. If, the, if there's a balloon within 5,000 square kilometers of you, you'll be able to get three to five megabits per second on your balloon. Okay, so I'm um, gonna talk about three different projects today. One is Project Loon, uh, another in, is a nuclear fusion project I worked on, and another one is an ion propulsion system. Um, so the, the start behind Loon was uh, the idea of trying to bring internet to everyone in the world. Today, two out of three people in the world don't have internet access. Uh, sometimes they have no signal at all, sometimes they can't afford access, sometimes they lost it due to a natural disaster, like in Puerto Rico, they lost it due to a hurricane. Um, there was an independent uh, research firm that did an article that said, uh, if we actually succeeded in bringing internet to everyone, uh, we could uh, lift 160 million people out of poverty and create 120 million jobs. Um, the way it works is we have a signal at some point from the ground, um, the normal internet, we send it up to a balloon. Then there's a network of balloons in the sky and the signal is, is sent between balloons. Once it gets up to one balloon in the sky, it can reach all the rest of the balloons in the sky. Um, it's basically a second internet in the sky. And then from the second balloon or third balloon or fourth balloon, uh, the signal comes down to the phone you have in your pocket. Um, so you don't, need, you don't even need a new phone. Um, here's a video of launching some of the balloons in um, uh, New Zealand. almost two out of three people on the world who don't have internet access today. And we're doing that using high altitude balloons. To steer one balloon, left or right, you actually go up or down. And that's because in the stratosphere, the wind goes slightly different direction at a different altitude. Our mission control system allows us to track every balloon and lets us optimally position the balloons so another balloon is coming just at the right time to take the place of the one that left. So that's how we steer our balloons. Um, and uh, this is one of the engineers who worked on this project, Samira Panda. She was a PhD from MIT in aerospace engineering and she was sort of the, one of the geniuses behind uh, sort of driving all this steering of the balloons. The way we actually steer the balloons uh, up and down is we have two balloons. We have an outer balloon that's full of helium and an inner balloon that's full of air. So by pumping air into the inner balloon, it gets heavier and drops down a couple thousand feet and finds a wind going the right direction. Here's a video of showing how steering has gotten better. We launched the balloons and then we, we're trying to do this. This is real data from a test we're trying to do in Peru. And these are all blue dots or balloons we've managed to steer. We can steer them very well now. We can keep them basically within a few tens of miles of our target. So all these balloons we've steered to be a very tight target in Peru. And that, that was another test we did where we connected 100,000 people in Peru. Um, this is a video of launching the balloon. It used to take us um, about 14 people, about two hours to launch a balloon. With this automated system, we can launch a balloon with two people in about 20 minutes. Um, we also have something called free space optical communications. That's laser beams between the balloons. And um, that requires highly accurate pointing of the laser beams the, to the degree of you need to point them within 10 micro radians of the target. Uh, that's 10 millionths of a radian. 
And the analogy is if you were standing, if one of us was standing at one end of a football field and someone was at the other end of a football field, 100 meters away, if you had a little laser pointer like you use to point at the screen, I'd have to point that laser pointer at you who's holding a quarter and have to get that laser beam on the you in the United States of America and hold it there. And we were able to do this uh, for about 12 hours. And I'll show you a video of this. This is, this is from a balloon. And you're gonna see a little white dot out here. That's another balloon that's 75 kilometers away. So that's another balloon 75 kilometers away. And you see this little white thing that appears. That's because the balloon is actually spinning around. And this platform here is despun. It's constantly fo facing the other balloon, even though the balloon overhead is spinning around. And you can see little tiny movements here in this gimbal. That's, that's pointing 75 kilometers away. And we're able to send a gigabit per second, a gigabit per second over 75 kilometers um, and, and holding it on that other balloon. And you can see it here, that's an airplane. That's at 30,000 feet. So we're twice as high as the airplane is, and that's the contra from an airplane below us. <laughs> cool. So a lot of people are interested in Project Loon. There's over 50 countries or uh, telecommunication um, uh, executives who expressed interest. Over the course of the project, I've been able to meet with uh, the president of India, the president of Brazil, uh, the president of Indonesia. Um, it's a very exciting project, uh, and all these telcos are sort of very interested in bringing this. We did, a, we did a pilot test in Brazil. We brought internet to a school there, and that school, some of the kids had never seen the internet before. Um, and one of the first questions they asked was, how many dogs are there in Brazil? So we entered that question into Google. Google gave the answer how many dogs there are in Brazil. Um, but it's really sort of rewarding to, to see people who have never seen the internet to, to get it from a balloon. Okay, so that's Apollo Fusion. Um, I'll talk about a couple other projects I worked on and then I can take some questions if people have questions. So um, I also am working on a project called, uh, the company's called Apollo Fusion and it's, it's basically trying to do uh, nuclear fusion. Um, nuclear fusion is very, very powerful. You can get it to work. One out of every 6,000 water molecules actually is deuterium. Deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen. Most hydrogen has one proton and zero neutrons in it. Uh, deuterium has one proton and one neutron in it. Um, and it's extremely energy dense. If you had 15 grams of deuterium, uh, you could provide all the energy a, a person needs for 100 years. Even this amount of water, this water right here, has enough energy, if you can get nuclear fusion to work, to power all of San Francisco for a couple days. So you don't really need much, uh, much fuel. The energy density of deuterium is a million times that of oil or coal or natural gas. So you'd need a million glasses of uh, coal or oil or natural gas to power San Francisco for a couple days, but you'd only need one half glass of water to power San Francisco. Uh, fusion is amazing. It doesn't do any global warming, no CO2 emitted. No air pollution at all. And I don't know if people have been watching the news, but uh, like in Delhi, India right now, it's really terrible. It's, uh, the, the pollution is about uh, you know, 1,000 uh, particles uh, per million, and you, only 25 is the maximum that's allowed to be safe. And so they're way, way over the maximum safe. Deuterium is also non-radioactive -radio and very available. Um, it's, it, there's no radioactive byproducts of fusion. It's not like fission. Uh, there's zero radioactive byproducts. Um, this is how the, the fuel cycle works. Um, as you continue in school, you'll eventually get to the point where you study um, reactions where you, where you look at uh, combining molecules. So this is taking two uh, deuterium molecules together, squeezing them together, you're getting helium, and then one neutron comes out and a bunch of energy comes out. And there's another variation where you uh, squeeze them together and you get tritium, which is another isotope of hydrogen, and you get a bunch of energy out. Uh, so basically it's very, very powerful. There's a couple different ways other people try to do fusion. One is called magnetic confinement. Magnetic confinement, you might have heard of a, a tokamak design. A tokamak is a, a big, big uh, building. This building is six stories high in Europe. Um, it's gonna cost $25 billion to do, and it uses very powerful magnets to try to contain the plasma. The reason is because nuclear, uh, nuclear energy, fusion is what powers the sun. So the, all, the, all the energy we have from the sun is from fusion. Um, uh, but in the sun, it's very, very compact. Uh, the gravity compresses it very much, and also it's very hot. Uh, it may be 50 million degrees in the center of the sun. So if they try to do it on Earth, 
there's no materials that can hold that sort of temperature, but you can contain that plasma using magnetic field. So one, some people try to use magnetic fields to contain it. Other people try to use laser beams to trigger fusion. So they have a very tiny pellet, about the size of a pea, that contains deuterium or tritium, and you fire a bunch of laser beams all at the same time from every different direction at this little pea. And if you get enough energy hitting that small pea-sized piece of deuterium and tritium, it'll create nuclear fusion. But these, this requires about six football fields worth of um, basically uh, capacitors to drive the laser beams. Um, and it's uh, very expensive also, $4 billion uh, to, to do this. Um, our system, which hasn't quite fully worked yet, but we're trying, is about the size of a washing machine. Um, it's much smaller and much less expensive. Um, it's a combination of electrical, um, static, uh, and magnetic uh, ways of controlling the uh, plaza. We use 50,000 volts, um, sort of very high voltage, to accelerate the deuterium ions. And the deuterium ions come from all sides in our chamber. When they hit in the middle, they're going fast enough that they fuse. OK, so the third thing I'm going to talk about is like a wild science ride we're taking today. Um, but the idea is to try to get some of you excited, even more excited about science technology. So the third uh, project I'm working on is an, it's, uh, it's an ion thruster for satellites. Uh, once you get off the ground and you're in space, um, you want to have the most efficient way you can to keep your satellites up in orbit and to maneuver in orbit. Um, currently, mostly people use chemical uh, propulsion. They use something called hydrazine. Um, but there's another way of doing it using ions. Ions are these really tiny uh, charged particles. You can, if you take any element and you strip an electron off, it becomes an ion. That's the definition of an ion, is an, is an atom that's had its electron stripped off. So if you have an ion and you can make it to a thruster, it's basically much more efficient than a chemical system. It's maybe 300 or 400% more efficient. Um, sort of much lighter, um, and we're trying to build some of those. There's a second space race that's going on right now. Since Sputnik was launched in 1957, there's been about 6,600 satellites launched. Over the next five years, there's a whole bunch of people who are planning to launch about 20,000 or more satellites. So it's sort of a second space race. It's caused by a few things. One, it's uh, thanks to SpaceX, is really driving down the cost of launches. SpaceX has had 12 successful launches in a row. Um, the second is the cost of building a satellite has dropped tremendously. And one of the reasons it's dropped is because of your cell phone. So many cell phones have been made, um, and there are very sophisticated electronics in your cell phone, that the costs of these sophisticated electronics in a cell phone are now used to build satellites. Inside your cell phone, you have a GPS chip. GPS lets you know where you are. That chip used to cost $50,000, now it costs about $5. Inside your cell phone, there's something called an IMU, an inertial measurement unit. That tells you which direction the phone is pointed so it knows you know, whether to light up or not. That used to cost about $50,000. An IMU chip now costs about $3. So using the technology from a cell phone, you can make very inexpensive satellites. So that's why there's so many more satellites being formed. The thruster we've developed, the ion thruster we've developed is very, very small and very, very light. It's about you know, a tiny compared from a volume compared to other competitive ion thrusters. Um, and if you look at the impulse per our thruster, that's the, the total number of force times time, newtons times seconds, it's about more than twice as efficient from a volume perspective as competitive systems. Our system is also much lighter than competitive systems. Other systems might weigh 66 or 43 kilograms. Ours weighs about 15 kilograms. And if you compare the uh, thrust uh, times time, the total impulse in our system versus the competitive systems, uh, it's about three times better. This is what our thruster looks like. It's very small. It's about the size of a, a can of soup sitting on top of three uh, pieces of bread. Um, and you have different variations of the propulsion system. And inside satellites, the current systems, if you have krypton, it, the krypton tanks take up a huge part of the satellite. Or if you use xenon, the xenon tanks for your thruster take up a huge part of the satellite. With our system, you can't even see the tanks. They're so small. Um, and if you can make it smaller, you can fit more satellites into um, a launch vehicle. Uh, there was an Indian launch vehicle that launched a couple months ago that had 104 satellites in one single rocket. Um, we're trying to make our system so that the typical rocket might be able to hold 33 satellites, but with our system, you could have 42 satellites. So that's it. I know I've gone fast, and I've covered a lot of crazy things. Um, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to talk about any of those projects, Project Loon, or the nuclear fusion, or the ion thrusters. 
Okay, first of all, how many people now want to go into science or technology after they finish? Okay, all right, other questions? Go ahead. Go ahead in the back. In the yellow shirt. Yeah, go ahead. Can I use this? Ah, okay. Um, hi, Mike. Thank you so much for sharing. I've been really excited about Project Loom since a couple of years ago, and I'm from Indonesia. So um, coming from a really remote village, I knew exactly how hard it is to actually find the connections. Even like my neighbor didn't know what internet is, and then now that they know, they have to still go around and then uh, bring their phone trying to find signals. So like, my question is that, how's the project now? And then how is it going? And then would you share to us how's the project Loom going, especially in Indonesia? Thank you. Sure. Um, we're really excited about Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia has, I think, 17,000 islands and uh, covers an area of uh, 750,000 square miles. Um, it's the uh, fourth most populous country in the world, uh, 250 million people. Um, I've been to Indonesia. I met with President um, Wijojo, Jowiki, um, and uh, he's very supportive of the project. Um, we are still waiting for permission from uh, uh, the aviation authorities for the balloons to fly over Indonesia. So as soon as they give us permission, um, we are ready to bring a signal to Indonesia. So hopefully that'll be soon. Um, thanks. Thanks for the comments. Other questions? Go ahead in the white shirt. Hi, my name is Donna. I had a question um, about Project Loon. So you talked about these balloons that fly up in the air and they're um, regulated by someone on the ground. Is that it? I'm sorry, they're what? So their their direction, their movement is regulated by someone on the ground. Um, isn't that really labor intensive? And per per person, how many balloons are controlled? I mean, how do you manage all of that? Okay. So good question. Uh, you know, are we manually controlling the direction of all these balloons, and is it very labor intensive? So um, Google is very focused on automating everything. And so 99% of what we do is automated. There's, there's an algorithm that controls the, the direction of the balloons, the steering. It's all automated. Um, we do have um, 24 by 7 flight engineers who are available if something goes wrong. Sometimes they even go to sleep, though, and they have a cell phone right by their head, and if their cell phone wakes up, they have to, they, to, to deal with it. But no, uh, it's automated systems with that many balloons making that many course corrections. Um, it's one, it's, it's, a, it's a software program. It's a, it's a well-posed optimization program where you're trying to maximize the amount of time the balloon stays over the target area with a number of constraints, such as the wind direction, um, the power available from the sun and the, and the solar panels and the battery, um, Restrictions some countries put on what specific airspace you can fly over, but all this is a well-posed problem, and we have uh, programs that can do that. Good question. Go ahead and which which part? The balloon is made out of polyethylene plastic. It's about three thousandth of an inch thick, so very 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 thin balloon. Um, the balloon uh, needs to handle about a hundred thousand pounds of force pressure. Um, but the plastic is not strong enough to handle that pressure. Instead, you have what are called tendons. Tendons are things like Kevlar cords that are about the size of your pinky. The Kevlars run from the top down to the bottom of the balloon, um, and that, that's what really holds the 100,000 pounds of force. Go ahead, follow-up question. Yes, what goes up must come down. And so all of our balloons eventually land. Um, unfortunately, no matter what speed the bland, they land, they're always considered by the press to be crashing. And that always drives me crazy. I'm like, the balloon didn't crash, the balloon landed. Um, sometimes the balloons, um, we try to land them in areas like um, sandy deserts, where it's really um, smooth and won't tear up the balloon, or um, places where it's like grassy. But sometimes they do land in trees, and we have to send out people to recover the balloons. Go ahead in the blue. Yeah, uh, well, I had a question about, like, um, like, let's say Indonesia, the people are flying around, and they're 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 flying around,
that we're trying to simplify that process. Like it'll have icons like, um, do you want a job? You know, do you have questions about medical questions? Uh, do you have, uh, you know, education? Or do you want to learn? And if you click, I want to learn, then it will take you to sites that have educational things. Or if you say, I want a job, it'll take you to sites that have like jobs. There's one called Samasource, which works in many developing countries where you can actually do work online and sort of earn money. But yes, we're trying to address that question. Um, go ahead in the, in the, you, go ahead. And if you can push the button down when you ask the question, I think it'll, everyone can hear. There's some sort of button on the, um, Try pressing the button. Yeah, press hard. Yep, now it's working. Perfect. Um, so, how would you uh, like um, compare your approach with Facebook's approach with regards to mass connectivity? Why do you think the balloon works better than a plane, for example? With who? Uh, with no, Facebook. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, so other people have proposed um, designs that are more like drones, uh, basically planes that fly around, powered planes. Um, from an engineering perspective, I think there's a number of advantages to um, a balloon. Um, the balloon takes no energy to go from the ground up to 60,000 feet. Buoyancy brings it up to 60,000 feet. And then once it's at 60,000 feet, it takes no energy to stay there. It basically, buoyancy keeps it up. If you have a drone, you have to power that drone. The engines have to, propellers have to always be turning in order for it to be flying. Um, so I think that's, I think that's a significant advantage. Um, Google X, the group I was uh, leading, has spent a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of smart engineers sort of bringing this technology. Um, and so I'm very proud of, of what Google has done. Other questions? Go ahead. If you can push the button until the red light comes on, then you win the prize. Ever since uh, uh, humanity has started to think about going to Mars, uh, have you ever thought of combining uh, the ion thrusters with your balloons to provide satellite uh, internet connections to Mars? So, um, wow, combining my different projects, that would be, that'd be wild. Um, so we can use, we can't use our balloons very easily on Mars because the atmosphere is so dense, so thin, that you'd need very, very big uh, balloons to succeed on Mars. But you can use the ion thrusters to get to Mars. And in fact, the very first project my partner and I worked on was an idea for using ion thrusters to get to Mars. And the thrusters that I showed actually can give a delta V, a change in velocity of about three kilometers per second, which is plenty. Even that tiny size is enough to get a small satellite to Mars. Okay, other questions? Uh, in the back and the black, yeah, you. Um, so, uh, what other material would you use to make b your balloons? I'm sorry? What other material will you use to make your other balloons? Okay, your balloons? okay. So the, um, the balloon itself is made with a polyethylene plastic. The tendons which hold the load are made with um, something like Kevlar. Um, other parts of the balloons are the solar panels, which are uh, traditionally, um, uh, you know, silicon-based solar panels. The batteries, which are uh, made out of um, um, typically um, zinc ion. Um, the um, there's electronics inside the balloon that are typical electronics that you find in a cell phone. There's a parachute um, for when a balloon comes down. Um, there's antennas that are made out of uh, you know, aluminum um, and other things like that. Go ahead, in the green. Um, I was just wondering how easy it is to... What the hell? Okay. I was just wondering how easy it was to move around between projects in Google X. To move around between projects at Google X? Yeah, or work on like the same one simultaneously. Um, so Google X has about a half dozen projects. Uh, one of them is the Loon, Project Loon the Balloons. One of them is the self-driving car. One of them is drone project to deliver things like burritos to people using drones. Um, it's, if you're good, it's pretty easy to move from project to project because um, every project is always looking for talented people. So yeah, if you, if you ever get into Google X and you want to move to different projects, it's pretty easy. A uh, couple more questions or? A couple more questions then? Go ahead, please. 
So um, for Project Loon, you were saying, um, I noticed the balloons were pretty huge, actually. And you also said that the lasers were pretty hard to focus because of the distance and the size of the points that you have to focus on. Um, so if you have enough of these huge balloons in a certain airspace, they'll start to cloud out the sky, which could interfere with other programs, I think. So um, how would you plan to reduce the size of these balloons? And then how would you ensure the same precision of the laser at okay. that point? So um, the balloons are about the size of a tennis court, which sort of may seem like big, but um, since you only need about one balloon for every 5,000 square kilometers, there's really not much risks of the balloons sort of crowding out the sun or anything like that. It's, it's actually quite hard to see the balloons. You can do it at a certain time of day. Very near sunset, you can see the tiny specks of the balloons. Or if you have really, really good eyesight, um, you can sometimes see the balloons in the sky. Um, in terms of the balloons interfering with other flying things like airplanes, most of the airplanes fly about 30,000 feet or 40,000 feet. We're at 60,000 feet. There's only two airplanes in the whole world that I have to coordinate with. And one of them is the U-2 spy plane, and the other one's a Global Hawk sky plane. So actually, I met with this um, Air Force colonel who controls all the spy planes at 60,000 feet. And I, and I said to him, OK, just tell me where your spy planes are, and I'll make sure the balloons don't interfere with them. And he said, no, it's not going to work that way. Uh, so I give him a website which shows where all my balloons are in the whole world. And he is a pilot himself. He took one of the U-2s. He flew the, the U-2 right by one of the balloons, and he took a picture of my balloon, and he sent me the balloon picture and he said, yep, your website works, works really well. Okay, one more question. Uh, go ahead in the gray. Um, I know that Project Loon is to provide internet to around the world. Is this supposed to supersede like existing internet infrastructure or is it supposed to like provide internet to places that don't have any infrastructure? Right, so um, primarily we're trying to reach the four billion people who don't have internet. Right now in India there's I'm sorry, in Africa there's one billion people, only 100 million people have internet in Africa, there's 900 million who don't. In India there's 1.3 billion people, only about 300 million have internet in India, there's one billion who don't have in internet in India. So yeah, the primary goal of Loon is to bring internet to the people who don't have it, um, either because there's no signal at all available, or because the current system is not affordable, um, or it's been knocked out by some natural disaster. So anyway, I'm very happy to have had a chance to present to you. I'm very excited about all of you and your futures, and I hope you keep science and technology in mind, and I hope you go on to do exciting projects like some of the ones I've been able to do. Thanks very much. <laughs>